ladies and gentlemen, it's a special pleasure to me to announce our next speaker, Karl Georg Altenburg, Chief Executive Officer of Germany, Austria and Switzerland at JP Morgan. After graduating from RWTH Aachen and the University of Technology in Vienna with a doctorate in technical science, he started his career at Arthur D. Little in 1988 and worked for Solomon Brothers in New York. Moreover, he's a passionate tennis player and president of the German Tennis Federation. I don't know whether he remembers, but last year I accompanied him from the car to the room and then back to the car. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, uh, listening to me today about, and I have to apologize, uh, a very similar topic I spoke to you or some of you about a few months ago, which is the, challenging, uh, the challenges of investment banking and the challenges in our industry. And I don't know if you could see this picture here, but I can see it. It's, uh, it's maybe not the perfect storm, uh, but for sure the topic is the same. And that's why I'm talking about the same topic uh, uh, today. Um, and uh, we titled the speech Investment Banking Between Regulation, Globalization and Public Opinion. Um, so it's a very overarching topic. It's, there's a lot of transformation and change going on. And uh, what I would like to do is uh, talk about uh, some of the changes we have seen already. Um, I would like to talk about the things which have yet to be done and obviously a little bit about the direction that investment banking is likely going to in the future, because it will never be the same uh, as it was. Let me also address at the end a little bit the issue of the public image. image. So on the first one, on change already happened. It's often stated, and we can read this in the papers almost every day, that nothing really has changed in investment banking since the Lehman collapse. It's basically all the same. Uh, banks are still gambling and they're paying their people highly and, and really nothing has changed. I believe and I'm convinced that this impression is wrong. It's not only wrong, it's distorted. The industry, our industry, went through a dramatic change over the past years and the process is still going on. This last financial crisis went much deeper than any other crisis before. And furthermore, it could not be controlled or solved with the massive sovereign support we have seen. So one thing is clear, simply going back to normal was not possible, and rightly so. Subsequently, it was also legitimate and to a great extent necessary that national governments, together with international organizations, have tightened the regulation of financial institutions and are continuing to work on the details. The excesses uh, in the capital markets we all have seen and for which investment banks without any doubt have to assume responsibility as well should be made impossible or at least very difficult going forward. And nobody wants a crisis uh, like the one we had uh, uh, to, to happen again. There are two comprehensive regulatory standards, Basel III and in the US the Dodd-Frank. They are casting their shadow uh, already on the industry, even though Basel III has not yet come into effect. And the implementation of the extensive regulations of Dodd-Frank uh, of the beginning of last year is continuing and will still take time to be implemented. Besides, there's a growing variety of other regulatory initiatives that apply to individual states or groups of states, which will, I will touch on briefly. A pivotal an important impact of regulation is, for example, that banks which are operating in investment banking hold significantly more equity uh, today, and that's the first change. And they also dispose of much more liquidity than they did before the crisis. For example, the core capital ratio of, of JP Morgan, our firm under Basel I, has improved from 7% in 2007 to 11% this year. Under Basel III, the new regime, the ratio was 8.7% at the end of uh, 2012, and we expect it to rise to close to 10% uh, by, uh, uh, at, the, at the current time. We will publish our results um, very shortly, I think next week, and you will get more information about that. 
The leverage ratio, this is according to a study of, SN, of an SNL, so-called SNL survey for the largest uh, 36 banks in the Eurozone, has improved from 23.1%. Leverage ratio defined as the relation between equity and total assets has improved from 23.1% before the crisis to currently 18%. The same is true what you heard about the capital ratio at J.P. Morgan for pretty much all the banks for, these 30, for the same group of 36 European banks. This capital ratio defined as the core tier one ratio, as the industry says, has increased from 5.9% to 11.2% under the full implementation of Basel III. More change has happened. Large investment banks have pulled back from proprietary trading, most of them completely. And while the importance of structural products is continuously decreasing, the significance of the so-called, we call flow business, the everyday business, is growing at the same time. Clearly, all of these things and all of these changes have an effect. They lead to lower returns, and particularly lower returns for investment banks. Besides generating growth, there are only two countermeasures any bank can take. They can reduce their risk-weighted assets, number one, and they can cut their cost base. And for banks, it's a people business, cutting their cost base largely means cutting compensation, and that's exactly what has happened. Compensation has declined over the past few years. Let me give you some numbers to those changes as well. Our analysts, the JP Morgan research analysts, expect that the leading global investment banks by 2015 will have reduced their costs by about 15% compared to 2009, the year at the crisis or right after the crisis. The decline in compensation will amount to 21% and jobs will be cut by 10%. According to these calculations, the compensation ratio, as we will measure compensation, will have come down to 32% by 2015 something our group has achieved already last year. But the industry average before the crisis was at 40% plus compensation ratio. I think all the major investment banks have significantly reduced already their risk-weighted assets, especially the last two years, and they will continue to do so. One area that is growing strongly as a direct result of the changes and of the increasing regulatory requirements, of course, uh, is compliance. The number of compliance experts employed, for example, by our company has grown by a few hundred compared to all for the, before the crisis, and we expect to employ in that area alone, JP Morgan, 5,000 people this year. I think it can also be said that um, investment banks have anticipated um, an amazingly fast to these new regulatory provisions. Um, this is not to say that much more remains to do. This is not to say that we have to find the right balance of these regulatory instruments, and I will talk about it later. We also, they have to be harmonized, but to say nothing has changed is not correct. There's a lot of detail to be done. Banks have to adapt to these changes, but it is underway. The industry is continuing its journey through profound changes, but it has started in a significant way, and that's visible. That's the first point in terms of the changes which have happened and, this, and the work we have to do yet. The second point is the value for our clients. What is this industry doing, and what returns can be generated from its business? The initiated and the changes that we are seeing, and which are a direct consequence of regulation for the most part, but with regards to products and services, are also due to an altered risk awareness, of course, and, now, and uh, an, an altered risk appetite of clients and investors. But there are three main constants that will, also, that will not change and that will also determine the future of our industry. The first one, banking clients are continuously and increasingly demanding investment banking products and services that live up to the realities and challenges of an international and ever more intertwined capital market. Investors remain on a constant search for innovative solutions for their preservation and growth of their capital. Second, 
Investment banks act as intermediaries between capital markets and its participants, and as such continue to be a crucial and indispensable part of every economic system. This is true even more, the more international, the more developed and the broader capital markets become. And the third point is, investors who invest in investment banks expect a return on their investment and will only become or remain a shareholder of a bank that can sustainably manage to earn more than their capital cost. It's not different in any other industry. All large investment banks that are operating globally are listed companies and therefore this point is quite important. Please don't get me wrong. I do not want to say that investors have a right to, rece to receive returns, but only want to point out that there are conditions, of course, under which investors are investing in banks. So banks have to continue to watch this issue as well. These three aspects at the same time ideally define the limits for any regulatory effect, so at least I believe must be considered carefully by the legislator. Also, let's be clear, governments and parliaments, so our, our regulators, have a massive interest in a functioning global banking and capital market system. I will talk about this a little bit later, but they themselves represent one of the largest issuers. Last year in all of Europe, Europe the whole total capital markets issuance, roughly a third was done by governments to fund their deficits. I'd like to shortly also talk about the second point, the investment bank's role for the economy, and more precisely, the economic value of what we do. I think it's a very important aspect. It's not, by far not enough understood, and it becomes very relevant when we continue this journey of regulatory reform. The corporate finance business, most of you have read about it and seen it or are interested in it, is the one with the highest public visibility, the M&A, IPOs, all these types of things. But it only amounts to one-third of the actual business volume in investment banking. Corporates need banks to grant them access to capital markets, provide them with working capital, foreign currencies, and hedge their foreign exchange risks and hedge many other risks. I think it's quite obvious to you what the economic benefit is. They seek advice to position themselves in a complex financial world and help them, help banks, help them to grow. So it's quite obvious. Less visible than the corporate finance business we hear and read so much about is the so-called, what we say, the FICC business or the fixed income business, let me say more simple, the market-making business. What is the economic purpose of a market-making business, which is the larger part of the investment banking business. It's often questioned. It's basically saying that's where they still sort of do their gambling. But I think the market-making in particular is a prerequisite for functioning market, which we can then use to access and raise capital. But people who watch our industry feel an unease about that market-making where the banks build inventories, where derivatives play a key role for hedging, and where it's very difficult to distinguish between client market making, proprietary trading, which, according to the Volcker rule of Dodd-Frank, banks will have to give up. We are of the opinion that in cooperation with the regulator, solutions can be found for distinguishing between client-related market making from the pure proprietary trading, which I told you has largely disappeared. But why do we need market making? First, investors need investment banks for managing their investments. That's number one. There's a lot of capital around the world which needs to be invested. So who are these investors? So who is behind the capital markets? Who are, who, who is, where are all these pools of money? Are these all gamblers, or speculators? No. They're mainly investment funds who manage the savings of private investors, insurers who work with the assets from life insurances, pension funds, who save the mi payments of millions of pensioners, large corporates, who manage liquidity and so on, and of central banks, and so on and so on and so on. In the essence, it's us, you and me. about our money, which is being invested in the capital markets. So all these groups of investors need investment banks, money managers who offer them new investment opportunities, define prices, 
secure liquidity so that they have access and can buy and sell their investment products. Second point is, without the preparedness to offer market making, orderly trading would not be possible, as we could witness during the recent financial crisis. Maybe we have forgotten this. When some banks were no longer able or willing to define prices, there was no price. So you couldn't buy or sell any security. Markets had dried out, in some segments completely. This did not only have a devastating consequence for the secondary market, but also led to a closure of the market for new emissions, where even the most highly rated firms at certain periods in time were no longer able to access the market. But what does this mean? Governments, corporations, financial institutions, everybody finances its business, its economies by raising money of equity or debt. And if that's not possible anymore, I think it's clear to all of us in the most extreme consequences that it would have a severe impact on any economy. If we think it through to the end, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, the economy would come to a standstill. So let me summarize. Firstly, the investment bank of the future will have to focus on client interests and be able to fully serve all their needs. Secondly, it should ideally not be restrained in terms of realizing the entire set of benefits to the economy. And thirdly, it will have to least, at least earn the cost of capital in order to be attractive to investors in turn who provide the bank with equity. So what does it all mean to invest in banking and how will it change in the coming years? That was the third point. So, as I said, I believe the reshaping of this industry is already in full swing, mainly as a direct consequence of the regulations that are taking shape and becoming clearer. I think we have watched these phenomena in other industries which have gone through profound change. Two years ago, our team of research banking analysts outlined the grouping of banks that would be formed in this dramatic change and what our analysts have said that we can speak of a so-called tier one and tier group, tier two group of investment banks, and thirdly, a group of boutiques, specialists. Again, a phenomena we have seen in other industries. You have large generalists, and there's probably a leading group, a smaller group, and then you have specialists, nothing new. Post-regulation, only the tier one banks, as we believe, will be strong enough to offer the entire set of products globally across all asset classes. This group of six banks, as we believe, will include, will include Bank of America, Barclays, Citi, Deutsche Bank, Goldman Sachs, and ourselves. Tier two banks, too, will mostly continue to operate on a global scale, but they will exit some product areas, namely the most capital intense, and they won't offer the entire set of asset classes. A rescaling of investment banking, which binds the highest amount of equity, can very well be a sensible strategy. And we have seen this. Some banks have, ex have exited, for example, big parts of this fixed income market making I've mentioned. Again, to give you an idea of how profound such a change is, I try to use the example uh, uh, in another industry. This would be, for example, that Mercedes-Benz is saying, we stop producing the E-class and the S-class, full stop. And we focus on trucks and smaller cars just to give you an idea how profound the change is. A more selective offer of products and services, more specifically tailored to the needs of core client groups, for example, in wealth management, frees up capital and can be used more efficiently, very positive effects on return of equity. So this could be and may very well, well be a very sensible strategy. Every player in this industry is confronted with the new world, which is characterized by more regulation, more capital, increased transparency, which taken together results in less leverage, less risk taking, less growth, and less innovation. The investment banking of the future will be less risky. It will also be less profitable. And there will be less money available for compensation and dividends. The critical mass of an investment bank will become more important in the future. With economies of scale playing an increasingly important role due to the cost pressure, as well as the, and this is a very important trend, vastly accelerating spread of technology in the trading business in particular. 
technology today has already become for JP Morgan one of the biggest investment areas. And it's like in many other industries, soon an area of competitive advantage or disadvantage. Parts of the capital markets business, for example, the proprietary, will not disappear. It will move to the less regulated areas, for example, to the shadow banks and hedge funds. In this new banking environment, which opens up a whole new question we don't have time today to discuss. In this new banking environment, we believe the tier one banks, as well as the highly profitable, but also highly specialized boutiques with the focus on consulting seem to be best positioned to achieve returns above the cost of capital. Many tier two banks too will be able to offer investment banking profitably, if not seamlessly across the full set of products and services. But only those who change their business model will manage to adapt to the new environment. And I think, let me also be clear, some banks won't get there. There is competition within the industry that remains the case. There is a relative competition. And of course, given the industry goes through much change, there will be winners and losers. And there will be consolidation. So this is something very interesting to watch. It makes it challenging, but it also makes it interesting. We all, I've said this, agree that ROEs, the returns on equity, will go down. The times of ROEs over 20% are history and won't be achieved uh, in the future. Our analysts believe that when Basel III is fully applied, the globally leading investment banks will likely achieve returns of up to 15% for the big global players, whereas the tier two banks will be more in the 10 to 12% uh, uh, range. With a view, when you look now at the three main businesses of investment banking, I mentioned fixed income, currencies and commodities, equities and corporate finance. Uh, we believe that the fixed income market making will remain the biggest, but it will not be two thirds anymore, it will rather be in the order of 50%. The impact of the cumulative effect of regulation on the return of equity, of course, is different by product, but that is what has been intended. For example, in this fixed income segment, the capital requirements are the highest and the negative impact on ROE is the strongest, which is why some have exited this segment um, and which why you will see a decreasing element, a decreasing weight of this segment. Um, and I think that is uh, the intention um, and it's being achieved. It's also clear, I mentioned this, there's a relative game. So tier one banks will gain market share at the expense of tier two banks. Uh, and in the equity business, just briefly, there will be significant changes as well, particularly in the equity derivatives area, where a lot of the businesses done by banks will move to clearing houses and stock exchanges. The corporate finance business I mentioned earlier, with its main product groups, the M&A business, equity capital markets, debt capital markets, will only be the least affected from it, because it has a much lower risk profile we actually see additional earnings potential in the future in this area of equity capital markets, debt capital markets. But let's be clear, the total effect won't be strong enough to compensate for the decrease in the markets making businesses. What's very interesting though, is the strengthening of the bond market, particularly here in Europe. And that's a direct consequence of the increased regulation. The European capital market, we believe will become more, will more look like the American capital market over time. The reduction of the risk-weighted assets and the higher capital ratios will lead to an increase in the cost of credit, your classical loan, and a more restrictive policy, of course, by banks to extend loans and credit. So that means the users of credit, corporations, will use the capital markets increasingly. In uh, the past, in Europe, roughly speaking, it was the, the corporate financing, the fin corporate corporations finance themselves roughly two-thirds by loans and one-third through bonds. In the US, it's already the other way around. Uh, and we have moved in Europe last year already to 50-50. And what we believe is the trend will continue in favor of bonds. Today, it's possible uh, that investors who have become much more sophisticated can buy bonds of almost any issuer irrespective of the credit quality, they have become more sophisticated, they can buy bonds from lower credit qualities. So this has become a, a very important growth area for capital markets, um, and I think very much to the benefit of its users. So let me summarize um, 
the point that the largest corporate investment banks, we believe, are best positioned in this new regulatory environment. They are strong, they have capital, they can adapt to the change, and they can bear the cost of the change. And the second point is that we believe others who cannot do that will retreat from certain areas. So the, in, in, in that respect, The Economist, the British Magazine, has published a special report recently on international banking, stating that the most successful large investment banks are not only able to profit from economies of scale, but also from economies of scope. If they manage, and this is an important point now, the benefit from being part of a universal bank. And that means combining and integrating the products and services of the investment bank with those of the corporate bank. And then, of course, cross-sell across those. That's exactly what's happening. We see a very clear trend that a shift from the classic investment bank to the what we would call corporate and investment bank. So what does it mean? It basically means that you serve a company not just for the next takeover or for the next capital raise, but also with its basic needs in its treasury service group payment services, simple financing, simple hedges. And that's exactly uh, what's happening. And the, the pure investment banking providers will more and more, we believe, uh, have a difficulty uh, to compete against this because it, it, it provides a very stable uh, earnings and it provides growth. And you can do it with less capital. So they either will become specialists or adjust over time. And this is what large multinational corporations need. They need, they have an international focus, they have cross-border operations, cross-border payments, and they need banks, they have cross-border, uh, all around the world, they have risk in many different ways, currency risk, commodity risk, and what have you, interest rate risk, and they need a global bank, many of them need a global bank to help them manage this uh, with a combination of products. It's complex, it's wide varying, and that's exactly what we do. When we think about what JP Morgan does today for Volkswagen, for example, it's not just only do the big capital raise when they need it, but we also lend them 20 million yuan in China. Uh, or uh, we have a payment facility in South Korea. So you really, um, uh, and that's exactly what the big banks are doing. They're combining their investment banking and corporate banking businesses to serve the needs um, of these, uh, of these clients. So, but that also means the so-called tier one banks, as a result of this, and to adapt and to have winning business models are becoming actually bigger. So the next question is, which comes to everybody's mind, the issue of too big to fail, which is also a big part of the concern and the public opinion and part of the discussion. So first of all, let me say that size in itself must not be obviously an end to itself. But I think it's not the case. And again, some of the reasons I already have given. Clients directly benefit from the positive effects of scale and scope, as there are price advantages, like in other industries, which we can pass on, and that's demanded by clients. May it be unit costs in equity trading, derivatives, or for bond issuance, whatever example you may choose. In addition, and I think that's also very important, the trends allow for an increasing diversification of risk. And we believe it leads to more stable and less volatile earnings. We had a mishap last year when managing our own liquidity, but you could not see it in the earnings because we were able to uh, basically shoulder uh, um, uh, the bad investment we made without an impact to our clients uh, or customers. The question is, and mistakes will continue to happen, not only in our industry, the question is if you're strong enough to manage the effects of a mistake and can shoulder it, or whether a mistake throws you in an unstable situation. So, therefore, we believe a certain size and equity um, is required. Our clients demand it. They need a global bank. They need global banks, uh, and they need strong global banks. But it's also true that a, a bank should never be allowed to be too big to fail or to go bankrupt. And this is very much true for those tier one institutions I spoke about, the large systemically important banks. Burdening taxpayers for bailouts in order to avoid a systematic chain reaction cannot be an option. However, 
we do not see, and this is our view, the solution in separating, as is often demanded, investment banking from the other banking units, for many of the reasons I just mentioned, but rather in the elimination of the phenomenon to the extent possible of too big to fail. Large banks must be able to collapse following a clear dissolution regime with strict principles, which starts with discharging the management, basically sending them out, and then winding down the liabilities starting from the secured ones all the way to the uh, unsecured uh, liabilities in an orderly fashion. That needs to, that's a very complicated process. It's very difficult. It's easily set, but very, difficultly, uh, very difficult to be organized. And it needs to be done, obviously, by a central resolution authority. But we have examples for this. The U.S. Dodd-Frank bill in the form of the FDIC provides for it. It actually has been applied. That's a good example. When you look at some of you have seen that the a big U.S. saving banks went under Washington Mutual. It was wind down under the FDIC regime in a very orderly fashion without uh, any damage to the capital markets. And I think we have to do the same uh, here in Europe, which means we believe we have to establish a fiscal union here in Europe and the key word under that is the banking union. Um, I would like to add that we have a lot of tools here as well. Uh, the BaFin in Germany is a strong authority. It has large and well-established responsibilities already today in this context. So we believe there are not many signs really for, the, for ultimately the, the need and the action to, to break up the large tier one banks uh, in the US at the moment, but the topic will be discussed and will continue to be discussed. I think this debate for us Europeans here speaking as a citizen and its respective outcome should be watched very closely, particularly also by us Europeans here when we discuss and implement our own further regulations. So this leads me on this section to a closing remark on the regulatory topic. We have made, and I'm convinced, substantial progress when it comes to banking regulation in recent years. A large amount of the implemented policies make sense and serve its purpose, despite the fact that we don't agree with each of the steps or each of the regulations which have been uh, implemented. However, we are now on the verge of also creating new risks for the financial system, as national regulatory efforts are still unfortunately uncoordinated and diverge globally thereby leading to a destabilization of the banking system rather than increasing stability. Our research analyst for the financial institutions, Kian Abusein, has established the term balkanization or extraterritorialization to describe those risks. What does it mean? He's referring to the necessity, of course, of a global regulatory framework rather than an individual balkanized regulations that can never be confined to isolated regions since they will affect the remaining differently regulated regions and cause reactions. So what do I mean? Individual countries such as Great Britain or Switzerland define solely national solutions, such as ring fencing or the Swiss Finnish. A group of countries within the EU is trying to implement the tax on financial transactions. The European Union decided to cap bonus payments as part of CID4. There are many examples. The US, same thing, is working on local holding model for subsidiaries of foreign banks which would force those respective subsidiaries to arrange their financing locally without their parent group. There are many other examples. The list is substantially longer. This will result in arbitrage. It will result in counter-reactions, market distortions, as well as in a massive increase of funding costs. And in the worst case, it might lead universal banks to separate their investment banking business. All this taken together could presumably be a result in another long-lasting restructuring of the banking industry. That cannot be in anybody's interest. I think it's therefore preferable that countries and regions which have not yet finalized their regulatory framework engage in a discussion based on the subject matter also with respect to economic and client interests. So in other words, the users of capital markets need to be at the table. And I think when you listen to an Ulrich Grillo who spoke to here earlier representing German industry, uh, he would very much agree to that. For us, for JP Morgan, it is of great importance that the US and the European resolution authorities, as defined in Dodd-Frank bill, um, 
do not constrain each other when it comes to liquidating transnational banks which are deemed relevant for the financial system. This is also reflected, and it's a positive sign, in the most recent legislative proposal from the European Commission on bank recovery and resolution, which we clearly appreciate. So let me come to an end with a few closing remarks on all of these dramatic changes uh, which are uh, going on in our industry, uh, and clearly, uh, which are accompanied by a very bad public opinion uh, on our industry. And you can read this every day in the press, um, and that doesn't exclude our own house. We're getting negative press, often for the right reasons. As soon as the word litigation comes to play, very few things, of course, can be said publicly. Um, so I cannot speak on any specifics, but I am convinced that because of the economic validity of the business model, that we have another, that we do not have any other choice than to reflect on and deal with the past, possibly coming to terms with it, as well as learning from it, which, which really means we have to critically reflect what we have done, what went wrong, and where do we have to make changes. And, but we also have to explain why we're there uh, and why there's an economic benefit of the business we're doing. Let me give you an example where we have to reflect and where we have to change more even than in the past. And I give you an example not from the trading or market making business, but from the corporate finance business. You all have heard about the big IPOs and the beauty contests which are done by banks to win these IPOs. And then it's a very often a common theme that the banks who are pitching for these IPOs promise a high price. And it's uh, the listener, the company who wants to go to the market is pleased to hear that the bank proposes the IPO will have a high price. But at the time when these pitches are being made, nobody can know what the price will be. It's often five, six months down the road, and often there's a disappointment, and the promises cannot be kept. But of course, if the bank starts to come in with a more conservative approach, sometimes it had lost these beauty contests to someone who promises a better price. That cannot be right. That is something which I would call a, a distortion, a bad effect. That is an area where our industry has moved in the wrong direction. So I'm firmly convinced that if we change our behavior there, it will ultimately be also to the benefit for those who do change. And the most important thing, aside from this smaller example, is that we have to better explain what is sometimes a very complex business, the complex actions we take. We have to improve our communications, and we have to become more transparent about what we do. People don't understand often what we're doing. But despite all this legitimate criticism, I also believe at the same time that we have to and we can confidently communicate and act as the capital markets advocate, not only for our own interest, but also in the interest of our clients and the economy at large, of which we form an integral part. I think being the capital markets advocate means that we initiate and plead for discussions that lead towards growing and deepening capital markets, show the importance of capital markets, importance for corporations, for private investors, for the economy at large. Many of our current problems, think about just one, the retirement provisions, could be more efficiently addressed through capital market solutions and a vibrant equity culture. I would therefore invite all of us and all of you to join in this discussion and be an advocate of capital markets. I actually think for many of the reasons I mentioned, it's a critically important discussion, which we have to lead. We have not succeeded in yet. It's critically important for the well-being of our economies. And by the way, and this is more directed to you, to all of you who are looking at, at a professional career, Despite all the criticism, it is also a very interesting discussion. It's a very interesting task which is ahead because there is no doubt that large and strong banks are needed and we need a lot of help to explain this better, to continue to do our business. This is 
challenging, it's different than it was in the past, but it remains super exciting. And therefore, I hope that you remain interested in this and join us uh, in this important task in the next phase of this industry, which remains super suspenseful. And um, of course, I thank you for your attention.